Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the number one resource for actors and talent seekers. I am your host, Jack Smart, awards editor at Backstage, and I'm here to guide you through every aspect of the entertainment industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. These intimate, inspirational conversations with today's most award-worthy film, television, and theater artists provide you, dear listener, advice on how to live the creative life, personal stories of success and failure alike, and maybe, just maybe, a tantalizing glimpse in the envelope. Find something that you're really, really passionate about to direct. Whether it's original, depends on what kind of actor you are. The other thing is really, really travel. I came alive as a creative artist in Indonesia. That to me was my trial by fire. Testing one, two, three, testing one, two, three. Let's see if I can do today's banter in one take. Hello, listeners. We have a slightly unusual, maybe, episode of In the Envelope planned for you today. Although I was thinking about it, um, today's deep dive into directing and all things being a conceptual artist and being inspired and turning your inspiration into a story, courtesy of Julie Taymor the voice you just heard. And what is a standard episode of In the Envelope <laughs> is sort of what I was thinking. Uh, there is no such thing as a standard episode of In the Envelope, and so this deep dive into directing is both of a piece of our mission to guide listeners through the industry, to shed light on artists' creative process, but it's also, it's pretty out there. And uh, Julie Tamer really has a unique experience with the industry. I mean, there are very few really big name, successful theater and film directors. Uh, For those who maybe don't know, Julie is probably best known as the person who adapted. She actually practically reinvented the animated Disney movie The Lion King for the stage, which is not currently playing all over the world, but uh, is constantly playing all over the world. I looked it up. It, It has now the highest worldwide gross of any entertainment title in box office history. So she's very much got the theater background, but she's also a a celebrated film director. Her films are trippy and visual and beautiful. And um, she's done biopics on Frida Kahlo, and she did that Beatles almost jukebox musical for the big screen across the universe. And all of that, I think, now informs her new film, The Glorias, which is about Gloria Steinem and casts a couple actors as Gloria Steinem at different ages. Her background is embraces no limits and no labels. You will hear in this interview her audition advice for actors as well as her advice for creators. But for someone like Julie Taymor, if you're an artist and you have a story to tell, there's no confining that to this is a screenplay for the screen. This is a stage show that will just feature a naturalistic stage show. Like she is mixing mask work, puppetry, music, sound, set, costumes. She won the Tony for directing The Lion King. She was the first woman to win the Tony Award for directing a musical. But she also, people may not know this, she also won the Tony for helping create the costumes of The Lion King. So she is someone who thinks very conceptually and draws on truly a ton of international influences in her work. A lot of her training was from studying abroad She at one point went to Indonesia. Originally, it was planned for three months, and she stayed for four years. She created a theater company there. She's created theater companies all over the world. But again, not really theater. Multidisciplinary is the focus of today's episode. (laughs) And um, as usual, I want to shout out Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. Do stay tuned after today's episode to hear from her segment. Just to give you a preview of that, she mentions in her segment following this interview, she Christine really hits the nail on the head when she highlights Julie Tamer's words about embracing limitations, using what is available to you, what's inspiring you to tell your story, and then to maybe even create work for yourself and others. Of course, Backstage is always there to help you do that. And um, I hope this interview provides you with plenty of inspiration. 
we really went there, she and I. And uh, for all you theater nerds out there, get ready. I think that's all I have to say for today. Let us hear a word from our sister podcast and then get to this fascinating interview with Julie Taymor. If you are listening to In the Envelope, you probably love theater. And that means that Playing on Air might be your new favorite podcast. Playing on Air records great short audio plays. In just 15 or 20 minutes, you can hear fully crafted plays written by Tony-winning playwrights, including Lynn Nottage, Doug Wright, David Auburn, performed by world-class actors like Timothy Chalamet, Audra McDonald, and Marisa Tomei. After each piece, host Claudia Catania leads a lively conversation with the artists about the play, their craft, the ups and downs of the theater industry. As I myself wrote in Backstage years ago, the sheer quality of playing on air's episodes makes them required listening for working actors and smart audiences. Listen, I still mean it. To tune in, subscribe to Playing On Air wherever you download your podcasts. Julie Taymor is a legendary, award-winning, multidisciplinary artist. Although she primarily identifies as a director, helming the Broadway and international hit musical The Lion King, the films Titus, Frida, and Across the Universe, and stage shows around the world featuring masks, puppetry, opera, and more, she's also written, produced, composed music, and designed sets and costumes on all the above. Julie's new film, The Glorias, from Amazon, starring Julianne Moore and Alicia Vikander, brings Gloria Steinem's memoir, My Life on the Road, to the screen. Here's our chat with the fascinating Julie Taymor. Julie, hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm very good. (laughs) Good. Um, Where are you also? I'm on Martha's Vineyard. Okay. The island. Oh, okay, yes, you're wearing a sweater, so it's you can't be in LA because it's very hot here. No, no, no. We're already into wearing parkas and parkas, it's, yeah. I'm on a bluff and it's very windy and, and cool. it's it's great. Yeah. Cool. Um, I am sure you've heard this before, but um The Lion King was my first show on Broadway that I saw on Broadway. Um <laughs> <laughs> it was not so much a turning point for me as it was for my parents, because that was when they realized that, oh, Jack's a theater kid and he will henceforth be into storytelling and into theater. So mm-hmm. I had to tell you, I mean, I'm a big fan, of course. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Um, and how are you? So how is 2020 going? 2020 is not going uh, the way well, we expected it. We want. Um, well, you know, the movie, <laughs> The Glorious, was really the last four or five years of my life. So I'm very happy that it got out five weeks before the election. We really were hoping, Gloria Stein and myself, Julianne Moore and the other actors were hoping to be on a Greyhound bus traveling through the swing states, you know, showing it to across across partisan lines too. We really want all kinds Mm -hmm. of people, all ages, both genders or all genders and, and and that didn't happen. So instead of, of having it premiering in movie theaters and showing in movie theaters, it's it's on Amazon Prime and a lot of other uh, right. platforms. But that's good because then yes. a lot of people will see it. And yes. I've been getting those. It's a little weird. I am isolated from human beings. I really find yes. it weird. I'm a theater person in that. I like the audience <laughs> and films too. We we had a great premiere at Sundance with a thousand people right. cheering, screaming, standing ovations. And we had one more like that in LA for 500 women at the Makers Conference. And oh, wow. that's it. Then it went into, you know, everybody in their individual hovels watching yeah. it. It's very bizarre because you're right. It's not just, we think of, I think of theater as being kind of the first, uh, first thing to go and the, and you know, that it'll probably be the last thing to come back, but you're right. I miss going to the movie theaters too. Yeah. It's yeah. A key component. We're seeing it in groups somehow. We had, we had uh, some, uh, outdoor drive-in experiences on the vineyard here this summer. And oh, cool. it's a little weird, the honking horns and the lights flashing, but yes. then, you know, they're alive. They're there. They're appreciating it. That was cool. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I just think um, filmmakers and theater makers, everyone, it's it's a resilient art form and people are coming up with ways to stay creative and stay inventive, for sure. Right, right. 
And it, for me, the Lion King is per- being performed in Japan right now. We do have one company, That's I think. Cool. <laughs> That's cool. I don't know how long that'll last. I think it'll go up and go down and go up yes. and go down. Um, you know, I've been working during this time. I finished my film and I've been working on screenplays, two of them. I just okay. finished one today. I'm very today. excited. Congratulations. It was supposed to be a theater piece and okay. it still may be a theater piece. I started it as theater. But then Trump got elected and the money fell out in Korea, which is where I started it. And I decided to move towards and make it a film script. But I'd like to do it as both, actually. I'd like to have it simultaneously. I'd like to do it simultaneously as live theater and film because it has a lot of film in the live theater. And so I should be making it for both both, um, mediums. I have Mm -hmm. so many questions for you. Um, Because we're backstage, we're backstage as podcasts, we are obsessed with the craft, craft and career advice. Um, Mm -hmm. going off of what you just said, how often when you sit down with a brand new idea, do you know what format it's going into? Well, (laughs) I I read the book of the glory of Gloria Steinem's My Life on the Road, and that's not a theater piece. It could be. I mean, I know that they did the theater piece at Daryl Roth's theater, but, um, when I read her book, to me, the places, the real visceral places, India, you know, New York, Houston, Toledo, Ohio, I I wanted the real locations. And uh, there are a lot of them in it. So that was obviously to make a film. And Mm -hmm. the, the, the things like the Shakespeare's, I've done three Shakespeare movies, but they all started as theater. And I don't think I would want to do a Shakespeare. I don't think I'd want to do it without having done it as theater first, because I feel like the minimalism of theater, the, the sparseness of, you know, you, 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 people use their imaginations. You don't need the literal locations helps you really get to the play. And it's a much more intimate time with actors and so i learned the play i did the i did the tempest two or three times before i did the movie with Mm -hmm. helen mirren and then of course i did it with men as prospero right and then i felt this play really really can be done with a woman as the lead character not Mm -hmm. playing prospero but playing prospera and it works Mm -hmm. to me better i actually Mm -hmm. prefer it with a woman Mm -hmm. in the role um so mostly, I do know which medium. I mean, if it's a play that's yeah. already written, it's a play like M. Butterfly. Um, then I would like to have done that, not necessarily as a full-out film, but I would love to have shot Clive Owen and the the two of them, Jin. Um, I would love to have done that as a kind of hybrid film theater. Cool. Because, you know, a lot of my work, Oedipus Rex, The Magic Flute, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, have been shot and have been shot very well. They're not just like, um, I'm sorry to say, but like the National Theater or something, you know, where you just stick a camera, yes. basically. They're right. really shot in movie style right. um, with with uh, handheld or, or steady cam and time to really get the angles and the camera movement that, mm-hmm. that I feel is necessary. So anyway, yeah. But these, these ones, yeah. I've been working on this since COVID. One was a book that was brought to me with a screenwriter attached. And so as a director, I guided her and that's done. And now we're going to actors. And then the one I finished today, or just about to finish after this uh, interview, um, <laughs> is, is the first uh, completely original screenplay I've ever written okay. from beginning to end. So I'm You're very wonderful. excited. It's not an adaptation. That's so exciting to me. Yeah, that's so cool that this is happening today. Um, Yeah, I just, my my producer just read it right before we got on and she (laughs) was so thrilled. She knows I've been on it for a long time with the ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that really is a first. I mean, of course, anyone who knows your work knows that you, we call it back, we talk a lot about on this podcast a lot, wearing lots of different hats. You're a Mm -hmm. co-writer or you're a director Mm -hmm. from an adapted piece or you're, I'd love to ask you about costumes at some point, of course. Right, but right. In, in terms of this completely original idea, did that come to you? Like, how does initial inspiration? What would you? How would you describe your artistic process from inspiration to fruition? Well, it was originally going to be a theater piece in Korea, and I asked the Koreans who invited me there to tell me their folklore and their myths. Cool. So it is based very loosely on an ancient myth that's not really written down, and mm. then I just spun off of it. And uh, um, it just came to me. It's in, in a funny way, it's a lot of outtakes from ideas I've had on things all my whole life. Okay. So it's probably the closest thing mm. 
to how I think and how, and the story I want to tell right now. Yeah. Even though I started many years ago, I feel like it's kind of its time is now. Um, mm. I don't know. It's just kept evolving because I went off and did the Gloria's. Even though I'd already started that, I I I got a job. You know, I mean, I had a I had right. a thing to do. Which yes, I started the Gloria's. It wasn't like somebody came to me and said, "Will you adapt this?" I read the book and went, "Oh my God, I wanted." I want to do this. Right. Uh, and I asked Gloria Steinem. She thought I was crazy, but she <laughs> she loves my work. So she said, yeah. sure. <laughs> and so how does it work adapting someone's life, especially when they are there and they're involved and there's someone you know? Because people have talked a lot about your your attitude towards source material. And I think you have sort of a um, bold, irreverent take on source material. I think for something like Shakespeare, it should be bold and irreverent. So how does it work when the person you are, the person whose life you are telling a story of is there and is involved and has kind of that personal connection? Well, she she was very um, freeing. She, I, I, the movie follows very closely what's in the book mm-hmm. or, you know, some things like the bunny, the bunny's part of it is not in that book, My Life on the Road, but right. I read about it and we knew about it. And there's lots of documentary footage of Gloria from a certain age onwards. Mm. What I wanted to get right was her childhood, her mother, her father, her journey to India, her first becoming a journalist, her then finding her voice, all the Alicia Vikander and the two younger girls part. Cool. The part where Julianne gets thoroughly involved is yeah. more known because it's the Ms. Magazine and onwards. Yeah. Um, and she's done speeches and, you know, she became famous and, and was a real known activist with all these other great women. So I said to Gloria, I mean, I love... I, what I think is genius about her is her one of her major strengths is that she's a listener. You see it. Mm. Sort of the opposite of the Trump Trumpian world of I'm sure. a leader. You know, yeah. it's like her way of is grassroots. She learned it in India, you know, the talking circle. She she mm. understands that's how you get people to expose their their stories and their difficulties. And they find out in this circle when they hear other women or other people that they're not alone and therefore journey, things can happen. Activate, it's activated by that, the movement of numbers of people together. Mm. And I got what I loved in the book and I told her the parts. I We, we had Sarah Rule and I worked together on a mm. screenplay. Then I, I took it on after Sarah had other things to do. So the last year was really... And also the kinds of things that I put into screenplays, the more surrealistic or gotcha. those things are things yeah. that that are more probably what you're saying, the bold thing. Sure. It's, that's how I think. I mean, to me, Visually. that's reality. Yeah. It's not just visual. It's conceptual. It's interior. Mm. It's interior truth. Mm. You know, when people say, oh, she went to India, she went to New York Times, she went to the, that's a, that's um, an objective yeah. look at life. To me, movies, art, theater, opera is there to give the subjective experience on an equal par with the objective. So when you have Mm -hmm. the Frida story, Frida Kahlo's, the film on her, the paintings coming alive, those paintings were her autobiography. So showing Mm -hmm. how they came alive is really another way of showing the pain she went through or the love that she felt for, for Diego or the sorrow. So to me, that's as those aren't gimmicks. They're not. They're not extra. They are the other way of right. telling. They're the poetry. I yeah. mean, otherwise, you say to Shakespeare, "Why do you do it with that language?" Totally. You know why people yeah. don't talk like that. So right. it's such a silly thing to think that a biopic should just be the objective. The, facts. Uh, right. the objective. What do you call them? Like story points. You know, from here to here to here to here. Right. So for me, the Glorias was a combination of the dramatic acting and locations the archival material, which is very important, the realistic stuff from the marches or the Houston Women's Conference. Mm -hmm. And also because we we had to do taxi rides in New York in the 60s and Boston in the 70s, we needed to get archival material for the backgrounds. A lot of visual effects Mm. in it, a lot. Yeah. And then you get the whole stylized thing that are seven or eight moments that are interior landscapes, like dreams and hopes and... And also the whole bus, the whole concept of the bus mm. out of time where the glorious, the four glorious can travel together, t- 
talk with each other, mm. chastise each other, mm. laugh with each other. That is a that is that was the concept. Such a window to see an era and a perspective and to see like lots of different women. I love this idea of seeing her younger self and mm. you got at that emotional truth. Is it safe to say that like you're not a documentarian and you wouldn't want to be what you're saying about how can you capture the exact truth, the exact fact? You're not trying to create a history of things that happened as it as it is. You're more interested in subtext. I'm okay. interested in both. I think there's parallel um, storytelling. So that, mm. you know, when you have a, a, a story that covers 80 years, all those decades, all those clothes, speaking of costumes, all those cars, all those yes. locations, how, what glues them together? I mean, most of our scenes were, you know, under a minute. There's a lot of short scenes. Yeah. The longest mm. one is with Wilma Mankiller on her deathbed. But mm. I think that um, the bus became the key because it was the glue. It was sort of the arc. Everything cool. hung off of this moving bus, black and white bus on a mm. highway into an eternity with the yellow slash line forever going to the next march, forever going to the next protest, the next talk, the next speech, the next you know, whatever that Gloria has been doing her whole life. I got to use the ages and the different mm. states of mind that a person is in at different times in their life to show that even though Gloria with the streaks and the aviator, aviator glasses can mm. seem so together, so composed, mm. we don't know what's going on inside. Right. So something like the the scene that that, you know, where she's interviewed... Um, and asked if she minds being called a sexual oh, object, yeah. you know? Yeah. And then I have, you know, one takes over another, and then we go into this incredible thing with the tornado and the four glorias. <laughs> that's that's me, kind of. That's the way I thought. Look, she doesn't say what she's thinking in three seconds, but what's behind the eyes? Right. What's behind there? What's in her head? You know, I liken it to what... When Kamala Harris, last mm -hmm. week, was listening to... Mike Pence, go on and on and on. And you see her just smiling, not yes. interrupting him. What's she thinking? What is she thinking? What was what was uh, Hillary Clinton thinking when mm. that giant orange man was, that ogre was walking and stalking <laughs> behind her? She couldn't say what she was right. thinking because she would have been trashed for it. She would have been condemned right. for it. She would have been criticized. So women over the centuries have learned how to smile and mm. don't say anything. Right. And I, even if that wouldn't have been Gloria Steinem's mm. hallucination, a lot of women have that feeling of, yep. oh my God. So at the end, you realize she didn't say anything. You know, it's right there at the right. end, right? She didn't say anything. She didn't answer. She answered him, forgive and forget. He asked if he would, she would forgive him. She says, forgive and forget. But we know that that, that, that question caused such turmoil inside right. but she knows how to gloria gloria doesn't get ruffled and she doesn't like conflict you know you see that in the thing but that doesn't right. mean she's not conflicted inside and that's what i wanted to show that's it's true. not like a barbie doll up there you right. know and it's like your job as a director is to as you say both both uh, recreate the events tell what happened and also speak to some more subconscious more subliminal emotional truth and of course Absolutely. use your own experience right like your own experience of being talked down to maybe in the industry absolutely informs <laughs> Are you that, kidding me <laughs> as well as inspirations like wizard of oz like where does the yeah. wizard of oz inspiration come from is that just kind of a well a stroke if of... you read her book and even at the member at the i think she says it in the in the book reading in india at the near the end of the film she talks about women taking journeys and always having to get home to there's home. no place like home there's no place like home I've never so the wizard of, it of oz yeah. the wizard of well she she talks about it in her book so it was it's posited right there in my life on the road and then mm -hmm. as a little girl, I love The Wizard of Oz. I still love The Wizard of Oz and yeah. the ruby slippers. And to me, the red ruby slippers with the red sneakers, with the red shoes of the Red Shoes Michael Powell's film, which is about a, a, a ballerina who wants it so badly that she, she ends up not being able to stop. You know, she ends up, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a um, punishment to the woman. 
oh, wow. to want to be so successful. Mm. You see, I mean, these stories, yeah. which we love, have an underlying theme that is not always as, as innocent as totally. we think. Totally. <laughs> And you're you're all about. And also, music. excuse me, I want to go back to that one with the Wizard of Oz. Oh yeah, it's also coupled with um, the Handmaid's Tale, uh, oh, sure. Macbeth, the witches, the witch bitch phenomenon. You mm. know, when a woman is too, if she opens her mouth, she's a bitch. If she shuts up and doesn't tell you what she's thinking, she's a bitch. And mm. what is a bitch but a witch? I mean, mm. it's it's something that has gone on through the centuries. Well, can I ask you about casting? Because we are backstage. Mm-hmm. First of all, mm-hmm. did you did you ever know backstage or use backstage? Of maybe? course, yes. I was an actor a long time ago. Uh-huh. You know, I did. I looked up jobs and everything. Sure, I did. <laughs> what kind of gigs did you go out for? That's so. Oh, cool. I was off off Broadway. I was in a uh-huh. play. I, um, God, let me see if I can't even remember what play it was, but it was. <laughs> It was so long ago. It was when I first came to New York when I was about 17, I think. And I worked, mm. uh, you know, and then with Joseph Chaikin and I worked with the Bread and Puppet Theater and I worked with, uh, you know, I, I went out. and You know, that's when I decided I didn't want to be an actor because mm. I was a very ingenue, young, pretty thing. And mm. I wanted to be a character actress and I didn't look like a character actor. Yeah, so okay. I realized I wasn't really going to have much control over my life. And then I went off to Asia and then I became a director. And <laughs> as, I mean, a theme in your whole career is it's just this idea of multidisciplinary. And it, is it safe to say that your experience acting, of course, informs your being a director and a costume designer and a yeah, well, acting and, and going to mime school and being part of Joseph. Uh, I, you know, I mean, I was part of um, Herbert Blau's company with Bill Irwin and Sharon Ott and a right. bunch of actors at Oberlin. And then we we created original pieces. And that's where I was also the costume designer. I was an cool. actor. I created the choreography. I studied mime in Paris. So yeah. be, having learned as a performer about the body, about masks, and right. then also being an, a visual artist the costumes thing came naturally to me, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, So yeah, it's not something I went out and studied per se to be each of these things. It just, Mm -hmm. I started to create my own pieces, my own works, my own theater pieces. And then I made the masks, I sculpted them, I (laughs) designed the costumes, you know? Often people don't even know I did the, I sculpted all the puppets in The Lion King. They're not aware quite. And I'm not you, a puppeteer, though. I'm not a puppeteer. That's been a big mistake. Oh, I don't like do that. The term. I don't yeah, manipulate yeah. it. I don't do the puppeteering. I don't do puppet shows. I mean, Juan right. Darien would be probably the most use, misuse, mixed use of puppetry. But mm. I, a puppeteer is someone who's a performer with puppets. Gotcha. Right. I'm a director. Right. Yeah. Totally. Totally. Director is the term that encompasses everything you just said. That's right. Sometimes I use them. Sometimes I don't. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, casting is an element that is under your umbrella as well, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you, I love, of course, Rafiki became female when she came to Broadway. Um, you, you mentioned just a couple things about the, about casting the Glorias. What is your attitude towards casting? Because, um, I think in the years that you've been working, the attitude toward unconventional casting, I'm using air quotes here, um, has changed. And I think you were a little ahead of the curve on that. Yeah, I've been doing it from the beginning. I mean, I lived in right. Asia for four years, and and uh, hmm. I've I've moved cross culturally since I was a child. Actually, mm-hmm. going to Boston and working with kids in Boston Children's Theater who were from the projects from Roxbury, from Dorchester, you know, mixed up race racially and in every way. So kind of like Gloria in that sense, you know. And when I was twenty one, totally. after Oberlin, I I got a fellowship to. Eastern Europe, Indonesia, and Japan. And I went to Indonesia for three months and stayed four years and had my own theater company. But, you know, things like having Prospera with Helen Mm -hmm. Mirren came because I wanted to make a movie of The Tempest and I didn't know who I wanted to play Prospero. And Mm -hmm. I I ran into her at a party, seriously, a DGA party, Director's Guild party. And I've always wanted to work with her. And I thought to myself, you know, people like Meryl Streep and and, mm. and Helen Mirren and Judi Dench, they are the supreme grand actresses of, mm. you know, of our culture. And yet there are no Shakespeare roles for them. None. 
because no. female roles are always the young woman because a young man will have played the young woman. Mm-hmm. Right. So hmm. I don't think most of Shakespeare's plays work just having, like King Lear does not work for me as a woman because okay. I don't think what he does is female at mm, all. Okay. I, I, I definitely think that The Tempest works because witchcraft, sorcery, you know, all of that. It's It becomes, it has a whole nother layer of meaning when yes. you watch Helen play Prospera. Very awesome. different. But we got, this is in 2000, what, 10, I think, or even mm-hmm. before when I did it. And there was a lot of anger. Oh, how could you make Prospero, Prospera? A oh, lot of anger. Really? And a lot of really fine English actors would not play second fiddle to Helen. They thought oh. they should play Prospero. Gross. Seriously. It was rather disgusting. Um, you know, she's always played second fiddle to them in whatever. Absolutely. But no. So that was a shock to me. But then, uh, you know, now you see so many Shakespeare plays with women playing the male roles, you know. So yes, a little ahead of its time. Right. And, and of course, Lion King, mm-hmm. Lion King 25 years ago, Disney had never talked about it, but I made a very, I, I said to them, I'm going to cast African-Americans or Africans mm-hmm. in these very important roles of Mufasa, Simba, Nala, the lions. Maybe mm-hmm. not Scar. Scar will be white, the bad brother. That'll be interesting, a black and white you know, brothers, this is a long time ago. You have to understand, you know, and, Absolutely. and, and, and though they're lions, you know, you're present, you know, who's acting them, whether, yeah. you know, so, um, what was fascinating about Lion King back then, like in Minneapolis, where we premiered it, African-American audiences saw it completely racially. They saw so many black people on stage for the first time right. in a musical that wasn't about racism. Mm-hmm. It wasn't ragtime. It wasn't yeah. about how difficult. It wasn't about any of that. It wasn't Porgy and Bess. It wasn't, you know, it was not about the, the, that energy of being black in America. Mm-hmm. It wasn't. It wasn't about being black. But it was black people on stage. So right. it was about the beauty. And Africans, you know, I also Absolutely. insisted, and they and they did it. I said, I want to have South Africans in this. Mm-hmm. Love OM is the most important part musically to me, to me. I mean, I understand and appreciate the Elton John songs, but to me, without Lebo's choral yeah. part and all the languages, four or five different South African Very languages. Cool. Yeah. Um, so I stressed wanting that heavily yeah. in The Lion King. And... For white people, it wasn't at all about race. It was just right. about the Lion King and right. good singing and good dancing and good acting. Yeah. So it was interesting to see that back then because there had been no Obama. You have to remember that these kids who came to see the Lion oh, yeah. King, African-American kids, they'd never seen a king. They see black people and TV yeah. and all these horrendous roles because there wasn't as much Put a, just put an African American as the doctor for God damn it. You know what I mean? Totally. Stop with their their <laughs> inner city, this or that. You know, yeah. that's what was important about the Huxtables and the you know yeah. at that time what Norman Lear did and you know the Jeffersons that that you were seeing real people there, yeah. other real people, yeah. um, representation, a middle class, upper middle class leaders. But back then during the Lion King, it you know I know that Hamilton, mm-hmm. you know that one of the major things about it is putting it's non-white people into uh, yeah. classic white white roles. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's amazing. And that became a big thing. We did it actually <laughs> without it being an issue. Um, because we're backstage and we have actor listeners, how often do you do those auditions? What is it you look for? What is your number one piece of audition advice for performers? Oh, I don't do it very often. You mean Lion okay. King? Well, no, movies, I mean for, though, for anything. Movies. Yeah. Yeah. Well, with movies, with the with the superstars like Julianne, mm-hmm. you don't audition. Alicia, yeah. I don't audition. Tim yeah. Hutton, um, Enid Graham, I just I adore her, and I just done, uh, directed her in and Butterfly, so the part's mm-hmm. hers if she wants it. The other people, like the little girl, they mm-hmm. had to do tape. You know, I'm in Savannah and I'm getting tapes that was not okay. in person. But then for some of the local people, I did have them come in because I wanted to, even if it was for two lines or three lines. Okay. I wanted to, I wanted to, if they were local. But see, when you're in Savannah, you're also having people come from Atlanta and Miami. You know, they, they if they could travel, you know, there's all mm-hmm. these different rules, right? Um, 
Yeah. So they, they read from the script. And mm -hmm. then if I feel like they might be good, I might have a conversation and ask them to do it again. Or sometimes, because we had about 120 speaking roles in the say, Glorious. There's yeah. a lot of day players, day players. Yeah. And they were amazed that I actually gave them direction. They were shocked. But I think it's okay. because of my theater background. Yeah. You know, I don't, I, 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 I believe that people don't necessarily have it right away. Some <laughs> do. But if you give them advice or you give them direction, they're just going to, it's going to be better, you know, and they like yeah. it. And it, 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 it's, it's really a good thing. So I, I got great feedback from, from the actors uh, who weren't the big parts, who I, who I just mm. met, who came on that day. You know, I'll rehearse with them too. Um, but really? I'm very proud. I'm a. I call myself a punum maven. A punum is a punum is a Yiddish word for face for mug. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. because I'm a mask maker and <laughs> I love faces. I really love the punums in my films. That's cool. In my films, okay. I mean, I love the extras. I get involved in the extras as well. Interesting. I'm huge on my wall in my office in Savannah. There's a huge wall of faces. And I put them together and I look at them and all of them are meaningful to me because a face, like Shakespeare says, can be a map of woe, you know, can be oh, a wow. map of joy, can be a map of deep experience. So I, I very much um, am interested in how you mm. people a film that they're the landscape as much as the landscape, that they say a lot about the right. office or, yeah. It's, it's other piece with set me. design and costume design. It's and, the, and makeup and hair, and you know? Judy hair. Chin, yeah. I've worked with a lot. She's the makeup designer. I've worked with her in theater and film. Right, that's so cool. And whether it's extras or, or a speaking role, what should actors know about auditioning for you? Or how can they like be memorable or be a face that you would want to work with next time? Well, one thing I found really tricky is um, I need to see more of the body. I think people, okay. they, they shoot their just their heads up and I'm thinking, no, but you, it's your whole body that is you. Okay. So for me, it's important that you could mm. do a, different versions. You could do the close up if you want. But if I don't see your body, I don't really know. It's not about, are you heavy? Are you thin? Are you this? I want to see mm -hmm. how you Movements. use your body. Yeah. Movement is very important. I think totally. we've got too used to with television talking heads. Mm. And and I don't. That's not my way. I mean, mm -hmm. I love I love to use wide shots, close ups, medium shots. You know, I I want the whole thing. So how you use your body can say yeah. a lot to me. And like you said, I mean, this all comes back to your roots are in theater. And so when you yeah. see an actor who understands their body, full three sixty top to bottom, that's mm -hmm. going to give you more options to play with as a director. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah definitely. Awesome. I mean, we also, we, of course, we love early career advice. Um, and we talked about directing, but do you, are you asked this all the time? Are you asked maybe how a, how a young woman or any women who want to get involved in, in filmmaking or in theater making, like, what is your number one piece of directing advice for early career artists? Find something that you're really, really passionate about to direct. You know, mm. whether it's original, depends on what kind of actor you are. The other thing is really, really travel. I think travel to me, yes. like for Gloria, I think I, I came alive in, as, a, as, a, as a creative artist in yes. Indonesia. That to me was my trial by fire. I have a book playing with fire that shows how I thought yes. about each production. I was 21 years old. I didn't know I was going to be a director. It just came to mm. me. I have a fellowship that's sort of on hold now because of COVID. It's yes. the, you know, the Taymor World Theater Fellowship because I had a fellowship when I was young. Right. And the young directors that I've chosen, my first group, the four of them, or three or four of them, I couldn't believe how they changed after a year of travel in South America and Asia and Africa, you know, the various ones. So I think travel gives you a vocabulary. Mm. It's important. We get too insular, especially Americans. Americans, we, well, somebody told me yesterday that only 4% of Americans have passports, something crazy. Mm -hmm. Now we can't go anywhere because, yes. because we've screwed up big time, but <laughs> hopefully that'll change. Yeah. But I think, I think, you know, a lot of people feel they have to do their first work has to be about them. I'm talking about movies. You know, a lot of people do mm. their own experience. That's fine. If you mm -hmm. really have a story to tell, Titus was my first feature film. Yeah. I can't really say that that's my experience, <laughs> but 
I was very moved. I did it in the theater first. I got deeply into the idea of what is this kind of violence, and I love Shakespeare. Yeah. So I, I felt like I, I knew the material and I wanted to put it out there politically, mm. artistically, you know, socially. And I was able to attract great actors because mm. of the material and because they'd seen my theater work. Um, that was my first feature film, which is pretty right. wild. It's, you know, it's not... But I think you can come at it any way. If you have your own story to tell or if you love a particular play mm. that you want to adapt or do it in the theater, um, there's many ways uh, of, of, of approaching it, but you have got... Don't do it for the money, especially the first, the beginning. Don't. Yes. Don't do it for the money. <laughs> and the other thing that's really important is... If you even look at Lion King, yeah, that costs a lot of money, that big opening. The second scene cost 25 cents, which was the shadow puppet of the mouse with the stick. That doesn't oh, cost beautiful. anything. Cool. It's a cardboard thing with a flashlight. I worked in very poor theater much of my life. Exactly. I can do movies for, Frida was, and you know, this will sound like big numbers for uh, theater people, but $11 million for a big feature film with Salma right. Hayek, Edward Norton, Antonio Madera, you know, it was an $11 Hollywood. million dollar film. Yeah. Then you go to Across the Universe, which is a lot more expensive because you mm. have to pay a lot for the rights to the music. And mm. it's the, but I still, I'm going back the film that I'm working on this year that is a very small film. So mm. I also think you don't just feel like, oh, I'm going to do this small thing and then I'm going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. No, right. Right. no. That's not at all the way it is. That's you know, advice. the scale of the story has to be appropriate to the story. Mm -hmm. If you can do it with minimal means, yes. actually, you will have more freedom. Right. So Garth Fagan always said that, um, let me call it, um, limitations are freedom. Yes. And an example of that in Frida, where we didn't, the script called for a scene in New York City, a lot in New York, I'm going down Fifth Avenue, looking in the shops, or it went to Paris. We didn't have the money to do that. So mm. we got, we, it got more creative because I created a collage of New York with black and white photographs. And then I put green screen, Frida and Diego mm. moving through it, you know, and then we, 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 I, I was able to take that material because I didn't have the money, find a much more creative way to do it. Yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, that's what that's what that's what's really important is what does theater do better than film? What does film do better than theater? You know, it's yeah. when I think about what medium. Because I I'll move constantly back You're and not forth if I to can. Mediums. Right. No. Right. No. And the advice is like get training in that idea of how to do a lot with a little. Yes, be yes. Yeah. Yeah. And really think about telling the story both, not just through dialogue, uh, because theater, you know, this is the thing with our critics. Our critics are very, our theater critics, uh, mm. they're very script based. But if, like, even in France, you know, they call theater specta le spectacle. Now, here, if we say the word spectacle, it, it is derided, it is, it is mm. thought of as, as empty. Okay. That is like saying a Picasso painting without the dialogue is empty or mm. a Beethoven, you know, symphony is empty because it's all music. It's ridiculous. You know, okay. theater yeah. is a combination of words, movement, actors, imagery, you know, the whole thing. Yeah. So get used to thinking for, I'm just thinking for directors in theater, but also yeah. in film of, of get, eat a lot look at a lot. When I was 16 in Paris, studying mime at Ecole de Mime Jacques Lecoq, where I didn't really have to speak very much because it was mime school, <laughs> every day I would go to the Cinematheque okay. and watch foreign films, foreign Old, to me. Obviously, right. they're not foreign. But I swear I got excited by Kurosawa yes. and Fellini and Ingmar Bergman and, and John Ford. And that was my education, was taking right. in these films and learning how they told the story through the camera angles and mm -hmm. costumes and color. So I, I've studied, I took, I took um, I think it was a film course in the summer, in the summer school at NYU once, and I learned how to edit, I learned how to shoot, I learned, you know, I got the basic, yeah. it was before we did video, it was with film, you know, Super 16 and Super 8. And oh, okay. um, so I really learned the technical, I had to get by the technical. And I also took courses, which I adored, in um, 
what was it called? God, I don't remember. It was a great teacher at NYU, but it was studying movies, even bad movies, and understanding mm -hmm. film language. Mm -hmm. You know, why do they use this shot? What is that about? You know, just primers. I didn't graduate. I didn't go to film school or really, I went yeah. to summer course, you know, and right. I didn't um, get a degree. I'm very much on the job, self-taught in theater exactly. and in film right. and in opera. I mean, Oedipus yeah. Rex was my first opera. Yikes, yeah. 120 people in the chorus, Seiji Ozawa, Jesse Norman, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a, a, another trial by fire, but that's exactly. okay. It's not that you, it's not like you set out, I'm going to be a theater director and then saw foreign films and said, I'm going to, like, you didn't picture any of this path. You just wanted to tell stories. Yeah. And much, I love this idea of like, you're not always going to just go from small budget to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. No. It's not some ladder. It's not, this industry is not predictable at all. You, no, what but also you it, was that yeah, eating, right? The yeah. education. Well, and it's the education, consumer. but it's also the 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 scale, the the technique has to be mm -hmm. appropriate to the story you're telling. Yes. You know, you don't, you don't, you know, you just don't arbitrarily do it that way. You know what I mean? It's like right. it's got a reason. Um, you got to know the rules. Yeah. Yeah, and you make the rules, and then you stick by the rules to a degree. Well, I think this okay. is great for our listeners who are are tired of limitations and labels because I think especially these days people can create but people certainly maybe in times of COVID when they're stuck at home are forced to have this idea of well, well how do I go back to basics how do I do a lot with a little mm -hmm. and what inspires me I think we're going through this time now of like what inspires me it's so cool to hear about your completely original screenplay idea that came from you and is of mm -hmm. course inspired by all you know 2020 <laughs> It's yeah. very it's very cool to hear about. Can I ask mm -hmm. you, um, we ask this of everyone, what is one performance you think every actor or every artist should see? And that can be film, theater, anything. But they can't see theater. Theater doesn't have that. You know, I you know. can't see it now, <laughs> but you also can't see it because theater's very nature is that it's ephemeral. You know, you can't sure. see it. Um, sure. I mean, you could say go to the Lion King if it's playing somewhere, but I'm not. We're not talking about that. One of the greatest things I ever saw was in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Makoma's uh, the choreographer. It came to the Joyce Theater, and I saw it again. His um, Bolero. It's a magnificent uh, mm. piece of dance theater, but films, you know. I've done that a lot, yeah. Criterion Channel, I did a whole thing on my 10 favorite films. So hmm. you can all go see that. And I do a talk about each we'll one. We'll link to you that. Know. Yeah, cool. <laughs> the Criterion, yeah, I was one of those with you know, with the movies. And I. so I go deeply into each, well, not so deeply, but deep enough into each of my mm -hmm. favorite films. But I've seen so much great theater, not in the West, you know, Japanese right. theater and mm. Simon McBurney's theater um, in Japan, I loved. But also just great no theater or Kabuki cool. or Bunraku or Wayan mm. Kulit or Balinese theater. You know, I've been, a lot of my life is in theater in Asia. So that right. I find the most inspiring. That's wonderful. I mean, it, I, I think the the takeaway for listeners is don't limit yourself to where they where the inspiration might come from and i love i love your approach to it has to be it, or it doesn't have to be but the more international the better the yeah. more inspiration from all over the globe the better well we're in a funny time where people are being it's you can't tell that story because you're a white person you know what i mean there's that but yeah but that that has a it has real value and in real importance what that value is is if you have a story that you have not been able to tell because you aren't a white person or a white, you know, in that, you should be able to tell your story. But other people can also tell those stories if it feels genuine to them. Yes. You know, I mean, do I need to go do it? I did it across the universe. Do I need to do another suburban white girl story? You know, is that where I live? No. I lived in Asia. I lived in South America. I lived, right. you know, for me, doing Frida Kahlo's story was genuine. Right. A lot of Mexican male directors were asked to do that mm. story. They didn't like it. They found it kitschy to do kitsch, you know, to do Frida Kahlo. Yeah. For them, didn't speak to them. They wanted to do, you know, like Inaritu and, and uh, Alfonso Coron. They wanted to do things more like uh, Spartan Scorsese, but in Mexico, you know, Amores Perros, or, you know, they wanted to do gritty, masculine, blah, blah, yeah. blah type of stuff. So right. 
but I connect to Frida's story. I mm. got it. I understand that. So there's a there's a an odd place where we are right now, mm. where we need to hear Native American stories told by Native American people. You know, African American female stories like the forty year old version is quite wonderful. It just yes. came. Yeah. yeah, you know, she should tell. She got to tell her story mm-hmm. finally. Now let's hope she tells a story that's got nothing to do with her. You yeah, know, or what totally. she went through, but. You know, if we get too too locked into you can only do this and you can yeah. only cast a gay person to play a gay role or a da 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 da, then we're back to only white people are going to do Shakespeare because, because there the was no black Hamlet. Exactly. You know, and that is just that's ridiculous. Limiting. So right. totally limiting. But I think you've got to say there's a reason it's happening now, and that's okay. That's a time. But then mm. as we move on, it has to shake it up a little more because. Otherwise, we women are just going to tell women's stories. No, that's ridiculous. I did no. Titus was my first film. Exactly. Yeah, there are good female roles, but I was as much interested in Titus and Saturninus and 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 especially Aaron the Moor, my favorite character mm. in Shakespeare. Cool. It was Aaron the Moor, the only one of two black phenomenal characters in all of Shakespeare. And right. Harry Lennox is the phenomenal actor I did it with in the theater. And then I brought him. He's the only one I brought to the film. So, right. you know, we don't want it. You, 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 Bergman did his whole life on women's stories. Is that because he understood them as a woman? No, mm. but they spoke to him as right. a man. You know, they he got deep. He worked with those women, whether you like them or not. So I, I mm. think that, you know, Maybe it's necessary that we, there is a time when you 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 say you, people get irate and say you can't tell this story. Sure, but that's because there's a lot of people who have not had the support to tell their stories. Exactly. So that's understandable. Right. So continue to support those who can't tell those stories and uplift or haven't those, been able to, haven't been given the resources. Yeah. Exactly. If you have the power, then give them those resources for sure. But yeah. it just comes back to your advice to storytellers of really follow what is genuinely passionate, what you are genuinely passionate about. What right. is genuine to, to like you, you, of course, Frida Kahlo resonated with you. That's evident in the film that enables you to bring your personal inspiration, your personal experience to the story. Mm-hmm. Those are the ingredients that yeah. storytellers need. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Oh, gosh, Julie, we've gone over. Thank you so much. For okay, well, thank you. Chatting. All this right. This is so much fun. Do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom for backstage listeners of this podcast? Vote. Okay. <laughs> like, I mean, there's nothing else. We have to take back the Senate. I know I'm a one, one, note, one note Sally or whatever, one note no, Gloria. Yeah. But be a Gloria and get out there and be active and help make this. I've, I've done my part. Now, I want all the young young people out there being irate, you know, really oh, yeah. out there saying this is my future. You know, it's yeah. their future. And they've got to not allow what's happening to happen to this country, yeah. you know. So yeah. that's my I don't have anything else because I used my art doing the Glorias. So my yes. political point of view, my social um commentary and my contribution was through my art that's yeah, possible it's and good. you can still make art out of it you don't have to just make docudrama or something exactly you know yeah okay wonderful yeah all right that's well so thank cool. you jack Thanks so much julie this is great all right <laughs> see you later And now it's time to hear from Christine McKenna Torella, our backstage casting insider. I will let her take it away. Hi guys, Christine McKenna Torella here, backstage casting insider. Julie Taymor is such a unique individual. She marches to the beat of her own drum and I love that because she has a way of tapping into creative pathways that are innovative and inspired because she listens to herself. Julie talks about how the world around us and our experiences can inform our work as artists. And I thought this was an interesting topic to explore this week. COVID has been such a strange and heavy time um, and it's easy to feel uh, heavy hearted about the restrictions in the state of the industry that we find ourselves in. But I invite us to think about this time as a way of developing our creative selves. As Julie puts it, she sees creative restrictions the limitations of freedom as a way of freeing herself from expectation. We've all seen the bread making and the career pivoting, the workouts, the DIY, 
knitting, crocheting on social media from our friends and acquaintances. And I'd argue that that's all part of your craft, even if it's not exactly taking the form that you, you thought it would. I'll give you a few examples about how everything we do informs ourselves as artists. Julie Powell in, in 2002 was a struggling writer who then decided to start blogging about her experiences cooking with Julia Childs, mastering the art of French cooking. And it became a best-selling book and a multi-award winning movie, all from her passion and her real love of food. Did you know that Lin-Manuel Miranda got fascinated with Alexander Hamilton because he picked up the biography of Hamilton's life in an airport bookstore? He could easily have picked up any other book. He had not planned to read it. He was just fascinated with the cover and wanted something that he could read on the beach. Have you heard of Emma Lovewell or Cody Rigsby or Jess King, perhaps? Well, they were all professional dancers, a successful working commercial dancers, they fell in love with fitness, started teaching, and now reach a larger audience with their passion for moving their bodies through the Peloton app. I also want to highlight a recent article on Backstage from Odile Jean, who's the star of Grand Army on Netflix, which was just released. And it's about her love of acting and how social activism has been an important aspect in shaping the opportunities that she's had as an actor as well as the person that she has become. She met the creator of Grand Army at an all-girls coalition meeting where they were performing plays on social justice. Take stock of your passions. What do you want to develop for your own personal and professional growth? How can you share your unique perspective with the world? What small steps can you take to feel creative each day? Julie mentions travel in her interview with Jack. And of course, we can't travel far this second. But what's attainable right now? Can you take a day trip somewhere? Uh, even take a long walk? Sit in the park? Make sure you're journaling. Make sure you're reading. Make sure you're watching other people's art. I know what you may be thinking, Christine. I can barely make my bed in the morning. It is a global pandemic. The election is stressing me out. Give me a break. And I hear you. Even if it's not immediately obvious, give yourself the grace and room to believe, as I do, and as Julie Taymor does, that actually everything we do and all of the experience we have will add to our creative selves. That leads me to the casting highlights of the week. So Julie, of course, is well known for her theatre productions. So I thought I'd pick out um, uh, another theatre call. So uh, San Jose Theatre is looking for self-tapes for a virtual production of Jane Austen's Persuasion. Here is a voiceover casting, a medical explainer, which is a national call. It's a work from home, taped from home situation. They're looking for female voiceover artists with a warm doctoral sound. And if you're in the New York City area, we have an all types beauty hair shoot in New York. Pays really well for a one day shoot. They're looking for all types of bodies and all types of hair. Check it out on the site. As always, these articles and casting calls will be in the show notes. Thank you for listening. That's all from me. Have a beautiful week. In the Envelope is recorded at Lotus Productions and Hyperbolic Audio in New York City and Soundbox LA, Mark Grau Studios, and Buzzies in Los Angeles. Thanks as always to our producer extraordinaire, Jamie Muffet, and to the team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage by using the code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. That's right, 100% free. For more exclusive content, join us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Would you like us to interview next? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another glimpse in the envelope.